Wealth inequality in the United States. This is what really matters with Tyler and Matthew on K O W L fourteen ninety, the Owl Tahoe's talk. So just to uh, quickly explain what wealth inequality is, if you had a society where everyone owns the same amount of stuff, then that would be perfect wealth equality, meaning that everyone has equal worth. Everyone has the same amount of money, same amount of assets. But obviously, that's not what society is like. No society is like that. No society is perfect. There's not a flat distribution of wealth across every single person. That would be crazy. Yes. So wealth inequality describes how unequally balanced wealth is in the society. And just a quick fact about how how bad it is in the United States is the top 1% owns over 40% of the wealth of the nation. And the bottom 40% of Americans own less than nothing when you account for all their assets and all their debt. I mean, that's that's striking. Um, But there's some who could argue this is just natural. This is normal. This is how wealth distribution has to be. The top 1% of people, some some people would argue that they absolutely need to have that much wealth. That's just how society is run. And this is absolutely not natural and normal. To put it in comparison, the last time that wealth inequality has been this bad, because it's been increasing over the last few decades, and especially since the Great Recession, the last time that wealth inequality has been this bad was since the 1920s. And there's actually a number that you can calculate how bad wealth inequality is or how good it is, depending on your perspective. And it's called the Gini coefficient. Now, every year, the World Bank comes together and calculates the Gini coefficient of every country in the world. Yeah. Their recent calculations show that there are several countries... They're doing better in terms of wealth inequality, is what you're saying. The the wealth is less distributed at the top. They are doing better than us in wealth inequality, and you would not expect this. We are number one in GDP nominal in the world, yet we are way down the list on wealth inequality. Countries that do better than us include Morocco, Tanzania... (laughs) Turkey, Madagascar, and China. That's that's just a comparison here. Yeah, that that's how bad wealth inequality is in America. We are the richest country in the world right now by GDP, but and easily our, the richest country that has ever existed. Yeah, but our 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 average Joe citizen isn't sharing in in those riches. Even though our our GDP is the best in the world. The fact that so much of our wealth is distributed at the top shows that they are carrying our GDP up. It's not the average person who's bringing that up. And now a lot of people say that, oh, well, CEOs deserve this, or this is just what you expect from a capitalistic system. But there's more than that. For one, I mean, obviously, the people at the bottom, there, there are janitors that work hard. No one denies that. There are school teachers that work hard. No one denies that. Yeah, the the people at the bottom, you know, even uh, menial labor or or hard physical labor every day, you know, these... These are the people who go out for their for their regular role, you know, uh, seven to five jobs. You know, they go out and they're just, you know, digging trenches or whatever they're doing. <laughs> yeah. and, and so don't tell me that they're working so or th- or that CEOs are working so much harder than these menial labor jobs. And, and secondly, even if you accepted that, OK, sure, everyone works hard, but this is still the outcome of a capitalist system. And there's no way we're going to change this or even perhaps that we shouldn't change it. There is a moral argument to be had. And this comes from the philosopher, the 20th century philosopher John Rawls, which was, which he was actually invited to, uh, Bill Clinton's White House, you know, when Bill Clinton was still in the White House. This was a well-known philosopher. Yeah, this, this dude, this dude was, you know, he, he was respected. He, he wrote a book called Theory of Justice, and he basically- That's a good name. <laughs> it is, it is quite a good name. He basically set a code, a way to determine whether a society wasn't equitable or whether there was, society was fair or not fair, depending on 
the, the, depending on the thought experiment that he set forward. So this was the thought experiment, something that he called the original position. And he imagined that you were an orb sitting in the sky or, or looking out on earth and you didn't ha you you didn't have a gender you didn't have an identity you didn't have a religion a nationality anything yeah you're, you're just, just looking down on the world from an objective point of view outside the earth right and and you haven't been born yet so this isn't this isn't the you that lives right now this is the you that had lived uh, or that hadn't lived before you were born and yeah, you this look is at you look at the world in an unbiased way and you say, would I want to be born into this world as it is right now? And if you say no, assuming that you wouldn't, you wouldn't get to decide where you were born. If you said no to, I wouldn't want to be born into this world as it is right now, then that means that it is not an equitable world. And it makes sense. If you, if you say that because there is a 40% chance that you will be born into a family that lo owns less than nothing, Obviously, it makes sense to say you wouldn't want to be born into this world. So yeah, I, I, I know if I was if I if I was looking down at the world objectively, and I had a great chance of popping down in an impoverished country, you know, where I would have to work so incredibly hard and get so incredibly lucky to even have a chance to reach the middle class in America like that the the wealth inequality is so bad and the chances of getting dumped in a in a in just a nation that is out of, that is just unstable or out of control that that chance would cause me probably i i wouldn't choose to be to be born if that was the case or at least I you could, wouldn't want to be born at the moment you'd at least yeah. want to wait for society to deal <laughs> with its problems or hopefully wait for society to deal with its problems right and and yeah. people forget how lucky they are to just be born in the united states to begin with yeah it it, it is incredibly lucky to be born in the United States. 5% of the world's population lives in the United States, yet we are the richest country in the world. So if you're the if you're the orb looking above earth and you're you want to play the dice, you want to play the lottery, that's what it is to be born in the United States. There's a 5% chance that you'll be born there. And then even if you're born in the United States, the best one of the best countries to be born in, you still will have it hard because we haven't solved the wealth inequality just even in our own nation. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, of course, here we're not saying that America is the worst country in the world. It, it clearly isn't. No. I mean, America is up there with the best countries, if not one, of, if not the best country to live in in the world. But that doesn't mean we don't have big problems to deal with. Oh, yeah. There's something called the Human Development Index, and it's published by the UN, and it's what they believe... It's a list of countries uh, that they believe have advanced the furthest based on a few economic factors. Absolutely. And the United States... Uh, you, the United States... The United States there. <laughs> yeah. Got all our stakes in a row. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the United States ranks five on that list. That means that out of the 193 nations in the whole of the United Nations, the, the UN believes that the United States is fifth fifth best in the world. Yeah. But they come out with a different list and it's the inequality adjusted human development index. Absolutely. And it ranks and us it's, in it's, the 30s. That dropped us from 5 to the 30s. Pic picture that. That's an incredible drop just because of wealth inequality. That's that's how bad it is in in America. It's terrible. So it's obviously not something that's just normal and natural. We need to dismiss that because other countries are doing it better, specifically the Nordic countries. If we want to get into how we could possibly solve this problem, I think they'd be a great example uh, yeah. to look at because they've they've clearly had it down. Norway is number one on the list in the Human Development Index, but they're also number one in inequality adjusted. So they have it clearly Which down. means Norway is the country that is that treats its people the best out of any country in the world. I mean, at least that's the idea behind the index. According to the economic factors, especially the ones that the United Nations decided to consider, which includes education and, and average income. Now, there's, there's an idea... Um, that a lot of, a lot of people, uh, will, will say, uh, when they're, when they're defending this, uh, this big distribution of wealth, just a ton being concentrated in the top 1%, 
they'll say something like, oh, the, the top 1%, they, they've they worked to get there, though. Yes, those are it's, the 1% sympathizers. Yeah, the, the 1% apologists out there uh, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> we're, i guess we're clearly against them you know i would we try to present both sides of the issue but i guess we are kind of against of them. course well we've kind of almost the entire time been rallying against them we, rallying with facts I mean, that's true <laughs> well we kind of we kind of want to have some sense of neutrality here at what really matters but okay. there are some issues in which where it's we, just it's hard to see the other yeah, side. It feel it feels like the other side just really doesn't have an argument. And and let let me let me tell you why. Because if 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 you say that, uh, let me cite the Institute for Policy Studies in uh, 2012. They found that quote over 60 percent unquote of the Forbes richest 400 Americans quote grew up in substantial privilege, unquote. That's the small loan of a million dollars that we're talking about. So you can't just say that they've worked hard for it, especially since a lot of them have just inherited it. Yeah, absolutely. The, th- the fact of the matter is, wealth inequality, it isn't a new problem, that's true, but it's certainly been getting steadily worse. I mean, after after the 1920s, which was uh, the only other time, at least recently, that has had such great wealth inequality, such vast, such a vast divide between the top echelon and the lower echelon. Um, af- after that, we we fell into the Great Depression, and then I mean, you, you're a little bit more well versed on this than me. Could you give the history yes. there? So, wealth inequality was extremely bad during the twenties, but it dropped dramatically during the Great Depression, which now, for, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Yes. So during the Great Depression, rich people lost their wealth. That's true. But historians generally attribute the the inequality uh, downward spike to FDR in his progressive policy plans. And so one way that is effective to deal with wealth inequality is just to tax the rich more. That's the most direct way of doing it. And it's also one of the most effective. Now, of course, there's some issues with taxing rich people more. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to just say, oh, yeah, we should just tax them until they're poor. But it is very helpful to have a progressive tax system because then it can help solve these problems before they become as monumental as they are right now. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And after after the 70s and during the 70s as well, we started to see this big rise in wealth inequality in America. We started going back up. From where we had gone down in the 20s, we've sort of spiked back up on an almost, you know, bell curve. We're going right back to where we were at the 20s. And, I mean, this is, this is pretty easily illustrated. I mean, you go back in, in 2007, it was bad, but not as bad as it is now. And then in 2008, obviously, we had a big recession and that set back the middle class and where we're at one of the worst periods of uh, financial disparity we've seen since the 20s. Although when you look at all of world history, it isn't it isn't as bad as it used to be. For example, well, no. hundreds of years ago, <laughs> and, you know, way back in the olden yeah. days, nine out of 10 people were poor farmers. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking, we're hearkening back to the feudal lord days of old, you know, where, where the, you know, the land was ruled over by landowners and the peasants worked for them and the landowners worked for lords and the lords worked for kings. Like, the, I Obviously. mean, so progress has not, been made progress since has the Middle made. Ages. Yeah, since, in I wealth mean, inequality terms. progress has been made since the Middle Ages, but that's not, it's not hard that's, to progress from what was literally called the Dark Ages. And, and that's, that's not something that a lot of people probably disagree with anyway, so we can kind of get that out of the way. Yeah, not as bad as the Dark Ages, don't worry, we're not back there. <laughs> anyway, if you're just tuning now, this is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew. Absolutely. This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490, The Owl Tahoe's Talk. And I'd like to remind everyone that here at What Really Matters, we at least try to have some sense of neutrality. Yeah. Some... I mean, I mean, so so far, we've really been 
been bashing the top 1%. So we've kind of been bashing people who support capitalistic systems. And I kind of want to, want to go into why that isn't the best way of speaking about this. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we, we've been really bashing the, these, uh, the, this economic system and talking about how bad the wealth inequality is. Um, but we haven't really touched yet on what the benefits and detriments are of having that top echelon of people. So one possible benefit, well, let me first start that, uh, first of all, the most direct way of uh, fixing the problem, like I had said, was just taxing the population, right. taxing the 1%. But you could also say that this is a way of just taxing without representation, because the 1% uh, would only have a, a small representation in, in in a system where the 99% says they should be taxed, and then without any say, they're taxed, Right. Because right. they only have 1% of the vote. So it is kind of a way of saying that they don't really represent themselves well enough. So rather, we should just leave them alone. But there's also more, eco there's a more economical argument, I think, that should be made. And that is that our, our economy relies on rich, uh, people that can fund projects, that can go out and invest in things. For right. example, we, we need, we need Rockefellers is basically exactly. what you're saying. We, we need people to go out and fund big name projects and big cost projects. Yes. And actually, I, some, some of the richer people in the world have actually been the most helpful in, in charities. For example, Bill Gates started his Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and he's the richest person in the yeah, world. Yeah. And, and, and let's, let's remember that Bill Gates back in the nineties was not considered very well by the world, you know? No, he was considered Considered a, a true capitalist that yeah. just wanted profit rather than helping others. I mean, people did not. I, I mean, maybe some of you might not remember. Most of you probably do. <laughs> but, remember better than we do. Yeah, better than we do. But uh, Bill Bill Gates was uh, not considered, you know, uh, uh, the type of person that would be donating a lot of his wealth to charity later in his life. But I mean, look. And how that turned out. I mean, so it, it seems a little short sighted sometimes to simply say that, oh, look at all these rich people and they're just desiring profit when sometimes it actually works out for the better. But that's only a circumstance for one individual. And it could be made the case that that isn't really true for all rich people. So yeah. it's, it's best to weigh both sides of it. And as I mentioned before, there are some countries that are doing better. For example, the Nordic countries. Now, uh, you might just say, well, the Nordic countries are doing better. Norway has a lot of oil. Iceland has a gigantic fishing industry. So yeah, sure. They can, they're, uh, they can be rich, but the United States has its own fair share of natural resources. Yeah. And we can do the same thing that the Nordic countries are doing. Yeah. We, it, the Nordic model, you know, that, that sort of thing epitomized by, uh, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders is a pretty big proponent of the Nordic model, just to give an idea of how that looks in American politics. Yes. So it's, I know I'm kind of visualizing, I'm kind of visualizing it and saying it as kind of like a, a tug and pull between people who want stronger economic growth due to lower taxes and people who want the economic inequality, uh, to be fixed due to higher taxes. Yeah. It's, it's very, very hard to argue that the top 1% aren't pulling this country, um, economically. I mean, it's clearly an economic benefit to have um, very rich people. I mean, they, I mean our GDP yes. is very high. That's if we could it. have very rich people without having very poor people, then I would be completely fine with that because I don't see anything yeah. wrong with people being rich. I think when, when some people pose this problem about economic inequality, they focus too much on the fact that people are rich. I think a better way to talk about this, and this is, I've, I've been trying to get into this, a better way of discussing wealth inequality is not accusing people. Yeah. It's to not say that the 1% is the problem, because while it might be technically true that they are the problem, they are the one that has the wealth, it's, the, the problem is not that they have wealth, it's just that they're, the, the bottom 40% yeah. does not. The, 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 the issue, you're absolutely right, it's, it's not constructive to demonize the top 1%. I mean, in our, in our first section there, we kind of, we, we, we did that a little bit, and it, and it's hard not to when you're looking at all these statistics, but it's also important to remember that they are also people. And the problem isn't that they have wealth, the problem is that 40% of America does not share in it. So, one, at one point, you need to realize, 
or I guess maybe we need to think about this ourselves. You need, you need to simply consider, is it better to have stronger economic growth or is it better to have a more equitable system? When you're looking over the earth in your orb, it, you know, this is something that I, that I brought up yeah. for anyone just, just tuning in. This is a moral problem where you can look at the world as equitable or not based on how you'd view it from the world in an objective position. Mm-hmm. If you look at the world and you say to yourself, would I rather have the world in the future be more economically sound or would I rather have it be more equitable now? I, I'm just saying my personal opinion is that it's hard to say as an, if I was from an objective position, I believe I would say I want the more the world to be more equitable. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's hard to be objective. You know, humans are governed by emotion. We are emotional beings, you know, uh, and there are a lot of people who just say this is an emotional thing. The poor people just want handouts from the rich. Yeah. Um, but something to point out is that there's a way, or at least theoretically, there's a way to reach that equilibrium where the bottom 40% isn't struggling per se, you know, but the top 1% still has accrued a lot of wealth. And that is by welfare or handouts, as some would say. And it's actually, it, it's, it's almost like it's two competing philosophies. Uh, some people view higher taxes as simply charity, whereas the other side points out that, well, charity has to be voluntary. There's this idea that charity is super erogatory, that it's, it's not, it's something you should be praised for. It's something that it's good to do. Right. But it's something that you should only be praised for it. You shouldn't be punished for not doing it. And that's one way that people see it. They they see the rich as being punished for their wealth instead of being rewarded. That's, that, I mean, that's very, that's very valid. That's, that's a, a, that's a valid critique of uh of the of the whole system and one way of fixing that is it's modifying the tax code to make it seem like less of a punishment so instead of taxing people on their wealth that they earned themselves you could tax wealth that comes from other sources for example t- uh wealth that comes down through the generations inheritance oh yeah inheritance tax Yes, and right now we do have a progressive inheritance tax, but it's obviously not enough, given Mm -hmm. the statistics and the facts that we've already presented throughout the episode. Yeah, uh, a a reminder uh, that that fact uh, that over 60% of those in the Forbes top 400 grew up in substantial privilege. So So it's it's not the the people at the bottom who go to the rich. Yeah, those, it's the those rich types who of stay there. Yes, those types of scenarios are not as common. And this is not just a rich and poor problem. You might think of it as, oh, this problem has existed ever since Karl Marx dreamt of communism. Right. And that's that's true. This isn't this is a problem, but it's also it's also more than that. It's more than just a class problem. It compounds racial differences and differences in uh in humans more than it already should Abs- so for absolutely. example black people are the hardest hit by wealth inequality and I-, I think i think that's something that no one will uh, that's something that no one will disagree on you know uh it- it's pretty it's pretty clear even just looking from your own point of view, even without statistics or anything like that yes so I feel well, like a lot of people will agree that uh, blacks are underprivileged. Yes. Yeah, so when you look at the statistics and you see that blacks are the hardest hit by wealth inequality, how could you sit there? And I'm just kind of saying this to a hypothetical uh, 1% sympathizer, like we said earlier. <laughs> yeah. Once again, not, try- not trying to hit, hate anyone. I know this is we already went over that this was a bad way of viewing it. Yeah. But Sorry. just theoretically, if I was talking to you, I just want to ask, how could you possibly frame it in such a way that you wouldn't want something to be done? And that's all of that I'm saying. Yeah, uh, I I feel it's probably, or at least should be, mutually agreed upon that something needs to be done. The question is, of course, how severe should it be mandatory? That sort of thing, you know? And this has been What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew. On KOWL 1490, The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. We'll Hope see you tune in next week. time every Saturday at one thirty. Yep, see you then.